Welcome to Pro Practice, your guide to piano mastery. I'm Josh Wright, and today's episode is the final tutorial, part three, covering the third movement of the Chopin Concerto in E minor, opus 11. We are going to be picking up from bar 415 and going to the end of the piece. This may not be quite as long as part one and part two, simply because we don't have that many measures left, but I did want to dedicate a full tutorial to this coda because there are some fingering consi considerations that I wanted to go over in there, and I want to definitely take our time as we go through there. I'm going to give you a couple of different options and then some other helpful tips to help you navigate that. We're going to be going pretty slow in this tutorial. I'll give you some exercises to help you speed it up, but if you want to see me play it fast, you can check out my YouTube recording that I recently posted with my wife and I performing it last month. Um, but I want to keep things fairly slow today so we can go over all the fundamentals and really get your foundation set up properly that'll help you uh, as you go into these higher speeds. Okay, so starting in 415, we already covered in part um, one, a few suggestions about how to memorize this. I jumped ahead to this since we've seen this same theme uh, in the first part of the tutorial that I covered. Um, but one little consideration, he does put staccatos. So maybe if you want to play up on those, or maybe take a little time or have them a bit more pointed, it's really up to you how you want to interpret that. I, even though the, the orchestra is, I never thought it sounded good to go. I, I do like it a little bit smoother. It's up to you. If you like that, you can do that, but I kind of compromised. I put it in the pedal, but I had it a little bit more pointed to honor that staccato. And again, maybe you push a little to there and then start less and then come back up to there, then come back down. And those staccatos, anytime I'm doing staccatos, I like to have two types of staccato. Um, I like to grab it in my finger and I also like to have a little wrist bounce. Those are kind of insurance policies against one of them failing. So if you, if you have a, a finger staccato, that doesn't get off quite quick enough, at least you have the wrist there. Or if you have your wrist nice and sharp, but the finger is a little lazy, you'll still get a fairly uh, sharp staccato. I don't think these staccatos have to be really sharp. I think I would have them be more like yum, bum, 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 very short, like violin bowings, or even maybe like an oboe, bum, 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 something like that. So it's not... It's not really sharp and pointed, it just the tiniest bit of stickiness on those. Okay, keep uh, continuing on, going to the C sharp minor. So by the way, this one, that's not G sharp minor, it's B major, because then it resolves down. So this is just a little suspension down to the resolution. So we're in B major. And then coming down, and then he darkens it with minor. And another dead giveaway of these harmonies is to look in the orchestra part. So C sharp minor, we resolve down to the G sharp. So two and three and four. It's really quite dark in here. And then he lightens it up, both harmonically and with character. Um, he kind of throws off that darkness. Uh, this is actually kind of light. And then we go to this G major, which is so beautiful. I like to really take a lot of care in here dolcissimo, so extremely sweet. So we have a little variation from what happened the first iteration of this theme. One and two and three. 
and watch out for uh what is that that is bar 437 it's not one and two and it's one and two and three sorry one and two and one and two and one and two and one and two and and then here i like to put my una corda pedal down far left pedal soft pedal and the way I like to pedal this, you can do what you want. If you want to do one long pedal, that's okay. I think it gets a little too blurry for my taste. It does have a little bit of magic to it, but I would probably do pedal, change, and then just leave it down. Because we do want that kind of atmospheric effect, very colorful, very blended. Um, he does put Rolentando and he does put Pianissimo. So just be thinking of the most magical sound you can create here. Still voice to your top slightly. Um, we don't need we don't need it be to be pointed out, but if you play the hands the exact same, something about the physics and the sound waves in the piano, if you play octaves the same, it always favors this lower one. I mean, you could make the argument that the strings are longer uh, the lower you go on the piano, so it's probably gonna produce a bit more sound, so. So just a little bit of an awareness of this top. So change, change. And I'd probably do a pretty rounded change there. You don't want, you know, super sharp. And then we're just caught up in this sweet moment. And then Chopin brings us back to reality in the orchestra. And then he puts forte here. So I do think we've just been in such a magical mood. I think the forte should be um, a feeling of freshness, a feeling of invigoration. Um, but I don't think you need to really poke it out. I still think you want to maintain that very innocent character. We have so much lively material coming up in the coda. I wouldn't go too crazy with this, so. So I would go to there, maybe a little time, and then come back down, and then a little bit of a movement to there, and then come back off. I don't like, that might be a temptation to accent your thumbs. It's really quite magical what happens if you accent those offbeats like Chopin has. It kind of creates this rhythmic tension in the line. And Okay, and you can do, he puts forte followed by a diminuendo. But I like to regrow to the end there. Fingering wise, I, I do 5 2 1, 4 2 1, 5 2 1, 5 2 1, 5 2 1, 5 2 1, and then optional 4 2 1 right there. You could also do an optional 4 2 on the A and the D sharp. 5 4 5 5 4 5 4 5. That's what I came up with originally when I was working out the fingerings many months ago. But. I really, I like to start it with the 5-4 and then I just kept fives the rest of the way. And I like to think of rotating a little bit um, to the top just to kind of throw. So. That seems to really help. Okay, and then orchestra comes in, dum bum 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 bum, and then we're at the coda. Okay, so. With this coda, the first little piece of advice that I'd like to say is speed is not as important as clarity. That's really important to remember. A lot of students try to play things, and I've done this before as well many times. I, I'm like so obsessed with the speed of something that the clarity lacks, and then it actually, it sounds sloppy. It can actually sound slower. It's the weirdest thing. If something is really clear, um, and shaped well, it actually sounds a bit faster and more lively because everything is sparkling. And even if it doesn't sound the fastest, like if you're not in Marta Argerich speeds, which I'm definitely not, um, I'm not that far off from those actually, as I listen back to my uh, performance, she's still faster, obviously. I was moving pretty fast in here though, but I practiced plenty slowly in order to 
really develop what I wanted to with the clarity in here. So that's just a little piece of advice. Don't don't get too obsessed with speed early on. Really give emphasis to clarity and shape and voicing and any other details that you want, and then the speed will come naturally um, over time. So really pay attention to this resolution. Don't smack that because that's such a weak beat there. One and two and we don't want to suddenly hit that after the and. Also here, I like to, again, kind of throw into that. And I like to feel my hand moving laterally, okay? Your arm will just carry your hand into the position it needs to be in. You don't want to, you know, be twisting and stretching with your fingers too much. Um, my teacher at Michigan's like, your finger is really bad at this, um, movement right there. He's like, it can only move a little bit. And he's like, and then it's done. So you really, um, uh, without straining it. So you want to make sure that that arm is carrying things into position. Coming down, this is actually a bit of a challenge because you're crossing over to two black keys. So I like personally to be flat in my fingers. And I like to think of ro rocking over and then falling back down into place. Okay, so again, feeling that lateral motion. I don't wanna be twisting and winging out my elbow at all. I want to be just rocking, rocking over, uh, like a, turning a doorknob, that type of rotation, and then I also want to make sure that my hand is relaxed and in position. So you could practice blocking this. That'll help you. You can practice it really fast. And that way when you break it up, it's a little bit less of a chore. Okay, so... And it's still, um, I haven't lived with this piece all that long. I started learning it about six months ago, which is plenty of time to learn and perform it um, at this stage in my life. I mean, that probably wasn't the case when I was younger. I probably would have taken longer to do that. But uh, still, to really feel like when you watch Argerich play it or Daniel Trifonov, who's performed this probably, you know, a hundred times, it just looks so effortless. Don't get too down on yourself if these are not feeling 100% every time. That will come with time. I would also suggest doing eyes closed practice. That will really help. And maybe spotting, uh, practicing just pieces of this. So rather than playing the chord and then the two notes, practice just the bottom note and then the two notes. So, and then just the top. That really helps as well, feeling all the components of the arpeggios. So, all right, continuing on.